It's the powerhouse of the cell. Let's go ahead and get that out of the way because I know it's coming. That said, I've released a good amount of content on mitochondria in the past because I have a wealth of experience working with mitochondria in the lab. Our lab has published multiple papers and reviews on mitochondria, including one paper on mitochondrial dysfunction, specifically the mechanisms. I may touch on that a bit here, but what I'd like to do is use a video wherein the host interviews a mitochondrial researcher and asks about the role mitochondria have in disease. And as they discuss it, I'll add in some of the details and take you into your cells. Also, at the end, I have something to say based on a conversation that I had with a researcher that might surprise you, but we'll wait on that. For now, let's listen to Dr. Picard. No, not Captain Picard, Dr. Picard. Yeah, I like how you said if you look at it from a mitocentric standpoint, like coming from like the mito mitochondria as the center, but... I think that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do because you can't see mitochondria. You can't, you know, you don't get a blood test for mitochondria, right? You get a blood test for your hemoglobin levels and your your kidney function and your liver function, but you don't you don't measure mitochondria. So um, it's sort of like a leap for people to say, or for some people to understand how widespread mitochondrial function and dysfunction impact our health. But is it safe to say that they're kind of involved with I mean, just about any health or or disease process at its core could be related to mitochondrial function. Yes, uh, certainly. We, we try to you know review this, um, and I should you know take a step back and say we think of mitochondria and you know that organelle as as you know a potential cause first a, a source and a source of health and 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 life but then a cause of potential diseases uh, th that's a scientific model right it's a hypothesis that we're you know invested in in rigorously testing and um so we need to you know do this carefully but the what the evidence that's there if you go into pubmed or into google and you look for <laughs> studies that have looked at some mitochondrial impairment, mitochondria have many functions, right? So alterations in some mitochondrial function, including energy transformation, but also mitochondrial signaling. And any disease you can think of, there is likely a scientific study that has investigated and, and identified you know, a connection. A few good points here. One, it's true that when we look to measures of our health, we typically rely on blood measures, which are famously devoid of mitochondria because red blood cells do not contain mitochondria. Additionally, we look to peptides like hormones and saccharide molecules like glucose and many other intercellular molecules that allow us to measure the health of our cells, our body through the communication between cells, but not nearly as much as focused on within our cells, known as intracellular. They're tightly linked, but intercellular will tell us little about mitochondrial health directly. So why do we care about mitochondrial health? As Dr. Picard mentioned, you can look up almost any disease and find a link to mitochondria. As you can see, there's an abundance, but that's just a tiny sample. And then the question is, uh, are impairments in mitochondrial biology driving those diseases? And I think the answer is likely yes. Real quick, this is the point that I'm going to return to later, but it's not quite as cut and dry as he's positioning it here, but I digress. Let's listen. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, I think it's likely because energy is such a central part of, of what we are and, you know, of who we are to, to some extent. Um, so I think that's why you know, mitochondria have been implicated in our, you know, there's growing interest in, in understanding the connection between mitochondrial biology and, and health and, and different disorders is because energy is, is central to, to what we are and, how, you know, how we function. And Captain Picard, I mean, Dr. Picard mentioned that mitochondria are vital for energy generation. Technically, that's not true, but I'm getting extremely technical here. So I'll go ahead and say that I agree with him. You see, your cells don't require mitochondria. They can generate energy through mitochondria independent pathways, such as a process called anaerobic glycolysis. 
But most cells rely heavily on mitochondria because it's a far more efficient source of energy for a number of reasons. For one, it uses fat molecules for energy, largely. And two, it generates far more energy per molecule. So the yield is much higher. Most of your cells' energy is generated in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ATP. And mitochondria make multiple times more ATP than our non-mitochondrial energy generation path. So I'm nitpicking here, I admit, but that's why I agree. But I wanted to throw that in there for the uninitiated. If we think about the brain, if you want to convince yourself and make this real, because you're right, <laughs> we can't see mitochondria and we have the chance here, you know, to have cool microscopes and you can put living cells and make the mitochondria fluorescent. And then you look down the eyepiece and you see them move and like fuse. And so you, you can see them if you have the right equipment, but <laughs> our day-to-day -day experience is, you know, is, is that of, you know, is a, our subjective experience and the kind of the, the reality of the body with, and how we feed it and so on. We're not aware of our mitochondria, which is probably for the, for the better. <laughs> but if you want to convince yourself that how central energy is, if you just you know block blood flow to the brain, right? If you if you occlude the blood going to you you know perfusing your brain for just a few seconds, you're out. <laughs> consciousness is gone, right? And the reason consciousness disappears if you if you don't have blood flow to your to your brain or if your heart stops is because you're not feeding your mitochondria anymore, right? You're not bringing them oxygen, you're not bringing them food substrates, and that you know shuts down everything. Right. So mitochondria rely on two things to generate ATP, the cell energy that we discussed. And those two things are one, nutrient molecules like the ones that you eat, like sugar, carbohydrates, and lipid, fat. And two, they require oxygen molecules. If we zoom into your mitochondria, you'll see a chain of proteins, and this chain is called the electron transport chain. These five proteins need an input of molecules that were generated from your food molecules. That's the carbohydrates and fats that we just discussed. I'm not showing it, but these food molecules, nutrients, get converted over and over into new molecules that are eventually useful for mitochondria. Once they've been converted to their correct form, they input energy through a process called electron transfer into the first protein of the electron transport chain. And at protein four, we need oxygen to take up that electron transfer. In loose terms, because I'm skipping many steps in the electron exchange, this donation of electrons by your processed food molecules to the first protein and the eventual exchange of that electron to oxygen allows your mitochondria to generate ATP, cellular energy. Now imagine if blood flow is impeded to the brain from something like a hemorrhagic stroke or ischemic stroke, then neither the food molecules nor the oxygen is being delivered to the cell, and therefore the cell runs out of substrate to keep mitochondria running. This is more of an issue in relation to oxygen because our cells are capable of storing nutrients, but not capable of storing oxygen. Either way, mitochondria rapidly grind to a halt. ATP levels in the cells drop and the reserves are consumed in seconds. And guess what happens to your brain cells? They die. Uh, so that's, I think, a very real example of... Uh, you know, how energy just sustains, you know, human life and, and, and human consciousness. Uh, so anything we do, as, as you know, you've uh, discussed, uh, you know, with many scientists and clinicians, uh, the way we feed our body is the, the, the kind of energy we put into the system can actually influence, right, how the system works, uh, the brain and, and the whole organism. Yeah, so let's talk about that for a second, because you know, one of the things we focus on at Metabolic Mind is the connection between metabolic and mental health. So when there's metabolic dysfunction, that can impact um, mental health and contribute to mental illness. And at its core, presumably, mitochondria are involved in, in that. So how does metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance and, you know, with some things that are so prevalent in today's society, how does that impact mitochondria? So yeah, metabolic dysfunction uh, is an, an umbrella term, right? For uh, that, in, in my view, re reflects um, impaired energy flow, right? So 
the what sustains life is the you know blood flow that you know the beating heart is like a clear sign of life because by moving blood you move energy you move oxygen you move uh you know ketone bodies and fatty acids and and glucose and proteins and so on so and these are energy forms uh so the disorders of, of energy or metabolic dysfunction can be reflected in insulin resistance as which is reflected in or which represents the inability of you know cells to take in food substrates when that's needed um so there can be metabolic dysfunction at the whole organism level right which can um you know cause or materialize in, in obesity for example then there's kind of uh, systems level uh, metabolic dysfunction insulin resistance would be a feature of this at the cellular level there can be you know metabolic dysfunction there and then if we go inside the cell there can be mitochondrial uh, energy transformation defects or you know impairments which of course ripples out if the mitochondria are not functioning properly that can impair how cells function how the tissue function and how the whole organism functions uh, so mitochondria are kind of a, 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 such a metabolic hub that their 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 um, inability to transform energy properly or misregulation of you know mitochondria getting turned on and making a lot of ATP or you know being dialed down and making less ATP can really uh, affect other levels of of biological and physiological complexity. Okay, that was a lot. Essentially, they're discussing metabolic syndrome, which is a host of different diseases lumped into one connected hub, like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and so on. Usually, they occur together in some capacity, although there are exceptions. As one example, obesity or overnutrition can cause mitochondrial substrate. Those are the nutrient molecules that deliver electrons to the first protein. And technically, they also deliver to the second protein, but... I don't want to bog this down. So those nutrients are so abundant and the need for ATP is not high because the person isn't exercising or being active. So there's an over delivery of electrons and instead of clearing them away by making ATP, mitochondria undergo electron slippage, which is exactly how it sounds. They slip on bananas and fall down the stairs. <laughs> no, they literally slip off the proteins that are supposed to hold on to them, and they interact with molecules they're not supposed to interact with, which generates unstable molecules called free radicals. These free radicals then cause damage to components of the cell as they interact. If this occurs over years, the cell is continuously being assaulted internally, and more and more damage accrues until the cell dies or becomes dysfunctional one symptom being insulin resistance. Again, there's a lot more here, and the mechanisms between insulin resistance and cardiovascular disease and mitochondria take on several different flavors, but I hope that you have a better understanding of how obesity or overnutrition causes harm intracellularly. So far, there's been a lot of talk about mitochondria, and funny enough, when Dr. Picard says this, and then the question is, uh, are impairments in mitochondrial biology driving those diseases? And I think the answer is likely yes. It reminded me of a conversation that I had with my PI. PI is a term for a principal investigator. He's the owner of our lab. We were discussing how mitochondria-centric everything has gotten in relation to disease. Like I showed you earlier, there are so many different studies that look at the connection between mitochondria and disease. But he mentioned to me that just 20 or 30 years ago, everyone was obsessed with the endoplasmic reticulum, which is another section of the cell. All these studies were linking the ER to multiple diseases. So are we just repeating the same mistake? Well, I don't think so, mainly because the issues in the ER still matter, but they just don't happen to be the whole answer. Just like I'm not necessarily going to jump on board with mitochondria and say that it fixes every issue. Although it is uniquely positioned to have an even greater control over our cellular health than even the ER. So the question is, how do we improve our mitochondria? Well, for that, my friend, let's take the enterprise to the next video linked right here for you. Or as Captain Picard would say, make it so. Mm -hmm.